Hi everyone, I'm uh, Chris Howard, the founder and CEO of firstbasehq.com. Um, and Firstbase is an all-in-one provisioning platform that lets companies supply and manage all the physical equipment remote workers need at home. Um, we basically take care of everything as a monthly subscription per worker, handling delivery, maintenance, upgrades and repairs um, that workers need to do great work at home. Um, and that really gives us a unique insight to the challenges and obstacles companies face while developing a remote working strategy. Typically, we hear from them when they begin thinking about making the transition to remote work. We get to talk to them about their needs and requirements, their concerns about going remote and what their motivation are, motivations are for doing so as well. Um, and from there, we've been able to develop unique insights around what is driving companies towards remote um, and what will happen to companies who don't make that transition. Um, and, and why is that important? I think everyone knows who's in this space that remote work is accelerated by what feels like 10 years and 10 days. Prior to COVID, there were projected to be 33 million full-time remote workers by 2030 across the EU and the US. That's actually how many there are going to be today after coronavirus is over. Um, now, by 2030, it looks like there's going to be somewhere between 70 and 80 million full-time remote workers across the EU and the USA today. And remote work is happening right now. But the problem is that it's been a catalyst. There's been a global pandemic. Companies have been left unprepared or in struggling to know why and how to make the transition to being more remote easily um, and efficiently. And there's a massive change of thinking happening in the biggest companies in the world right now because of this. They were reluctant to go remote because they knew the status quo worked and going remote was too much of a risk. Um, and now everyone knows remote work works. The risk has actually shifted to companies not leveraging the benefits of remote to build more resilient companies. Um, and whether it's making the transition full time, moving towards a blended approach where people work remote and from the office half the time each, or from a disaster continuity purpose as a contingency if this happens again, thousands of companies and millions of workers are going to be going remote in the next 10 years. And the reason for that is that 74% of CFOs are saying right now they're going to transition to a more um, remote setup after this. The biggest enterprises on the planet are planning to cut commercial real estate footprint by up to 50% is what we're hearing from them. And if they did this and let everyone work from home who could, there would be a $1.8 trillion saving a year on real estate costs in the US alone. And the evolution of real estate has always been dictated by cost rather than what's best for workers getting work done. Um, it started out as the optimum place to get work done. That was what it was designed for. That was its entire purpose. And because of that, everyone had a private office to do deep focus work without um, distraction. As the cost of real estate has risen, the square foot for each worker is basically decreased. It's the reason we went from private offices to cubicles to open plan everything that we have today. Co-working took that and basically put it on steroids, not just having the distraction of colleagues, but strangers as well. And then people started inserting things like table tennis tables, laundry, restaurants. Companies offered more to increase the amount of time that people actually spent there. Um, and as this has happened, offices have actually become the worst place to do deep focused work. And we see remote returning us to the past, giving everyone the isolation and space to do the best work they've ever done in their lives without the constant distractions you get in offices. COVID has actually forced companies to recognize this. Um, and as great work continues to get done without the office, what is the purpose of the office that actually remains? And companies who don't cut their office footprint will be economically uncompetitive fairly quickly. It looks like it's gonna be strategic suicide to go back to the office having seen that remote working works. The 2008 financial collapse gave rise to co-working as an alternative to bespoke offices. COVID-19 has exposed every company to the realities of remote work. And that means that moving forward, companies are gonna to have to make one of three decisions. Go back to the office. Um, this is gonna to lead to bad situations for companies one to three years from now. Move to co-working spaces. Again, probably in a slightly longer burn, three to five years. 
or cut real estate footprint by 50% and let everyone work from home two or three days a week, an office or a co-working space the rest of the time, these are the companies that will dominate this next decade. Um, so what's my point? The workplace is changing, but why should companies really care? Um, the reason's incredibly simple, talent and efficiency. Companies who adopted technology 20 years ago replaced every company that didn't. Companies who ado adopt remote work now will replace every company that doesn't tomorrow. We're in the initial stages of this sea change of operations, but I think we're already starting to see a number of key strategic benefits for switching. And unless you're Google, Amazon, Facebook, or Apple, remote teams will be far more talented than any office-based team you can build. Talent wars will be won by companies that have great remote work capacity, who will then wield that to dominate the next decade of hiring. My personal feeling is that the only companies who can really afford to go back to being office first are monopolies. Every single company who goes back to the office who isn't a monopoly will be replaced by a remote first competitor at some point in the next 10 years. If you are an office first company today with no competitors and remain office first, a remote first competitor will emerge and do what you do far more efficiently and do it with a far more talented team than you can build being office first. And the problem is that having a fixed location limits how talented you can become as a company. Only being able to hire the best person you can afford in a 30 mile radius of a physical location disqualifies you from 99.9% .9 of the world's talent. Remote companies will hire the best person on the planet for every single role. Um, not only will remote teams be more talented, but they'll also be the most diverse teams that the world's ever seen. And both those things mean that office first companies will be exponentially less talented and competitive than remote first teams. And great talent wants remote opportunities. Great companies want to hire great workers, that's obvious. The problem is that companies that don't let their workers operate remotely after this will lose all their best people to their fiercest competitors. And my thinking on this has actually changed a little bit since COVID has happened. I always thought the rise of remote would be something driven by great people demanding remote opportunities as a condition of employment. Now I think that companies who've got comfort with it will push for this transition and, and empower their workers with the flexibility they need, they need to do better work. And the issue here is around retention. It's that more people know today that they want to work remotely, but also more companies know that they can operate that way. And if your current employer doesn't give you the opportunity to work remotely after this, you're likely to leave for a company that will. And that means I believe we're about to live through the most volatile age of turnover within companies that we've probably um, ever seen. And the reason for that is that the smartest people I know all plan to work remotely this decade, and the best companies I know personally all plan to hire remotely this decade. And there's a massive first mover advantage for companies here. Um, not only will they retain their, their own most talented people by stopping them from jumping ship to their fiercest remote first competitors, they'll be able to attract the most talented people from their biggest competitors themselves. And this is a massive competitive advantage that many companies will exploit once COVID passes and certain companies don't adapt to going remote quickly enough. And while office first companies bleed talent and can only replace it with whoever happens to live locally, remote first companies will hire globally and become more talented with each hire. This is a superpower of remote, growing the size of the pond that they can hire from while at the same time increasing the bait that they have to get people to bite and join the company. And office first companies won't be able to compete with remote first companies in terms of efficiency, both economically and operationally as well. Not only will remote first companies increase their average level of talent with each hire, they'll be far more cost efficient at the same time. And that's even more important. While remote first companies get less talented, their costs will remain flat. Office first companies get more talent while being able to operate with a far lower overhead. Each person in the average office costs um, around $22,000 a year to provision them that. 
Each person in a co-working space costs around 11,000. Each person at home that you allow to work remotely costs you less than $2,000 a year. And that's a massive difference. For large companies, this could reduce their real estate spend by $20 million per thousand workers who go remote. Um, and companies are going to move to cut real estate footprint by up to 50%, which would mean that rather than the 20 million, they would save 10 million a year per thousand workers. And that's the most likely scenario. It feels similar to companies while workers at the same time get the flexibility that they're looking for while being able to work remotely more frequently. And I think the problem with offices is that they've become somewhat adult kids club like where it's impossible to focus and do deep work without um, distraction. And remote work gives you the optimum space you need to do your best work. Remote workers have been proven to be 15 percent more productive, which gives companies 40 extra days a year in total productivity for remote workers versus office workers doing the same thing. Um, and the instantaneous gratification of availability that synchronous first offices provide is a massive problem for efficiency. Most offices talk about collaboration, but what they're really talking about is distraction and disruption from availability. Companies who replicate the bad parts of office working remotely will destroy many of the massive benefits of remote and asynchronous working. And that brings you to the, the metric that all bad ma ma middle managers use to measure performance. It's time spent in the office. Remote work is about how much work you get done focusing on productivity instead. And this requires a huge change of thinking inside organizations. Many get comfort seeing their team inside the office for 40 hours a week, even if they're only actually, actually working a small fraction of them. Can companies actually trust their team to be adults and do their work at home? or not. Um, and the best personal example I have of this was a friend who was building a marketing team in London. They decided to go fully remote. And before they did it, they spent some time measuring how much work each person got done in a week. Um, they then went to their remote team and said, their, their team sorry, and said, how much work do you guys think that you can get done in a week? Um, and the workers actually estimated that they thought they could do 10 to 20% more work than what management had measured that they'd done. So finally, they go remote, and by Wednesday morning of the first week, every single person on the team had finished their whole week's work. And that's a real difference. Remote is just about getting work done without those distractions. The challenge is that going remote isn't easy. Um, remote work could be the biggest workplace revolution in history, and potentially nothing will deliver a higher quality of life increase this decade than that. Workers having more flexibility to, de to decide their schedule, able to operate when they are most productive rather than a fixed day, enables a far better future of work than the one we're currently experiencing. Organizing work around your life is a huge transition with major implications. Um, it means you don't have to ask your boss permission to go to appointments anymore. You can go and drop and pick your kids up from school every day. Um, you can go for a run in the afternoon if that's what recharges you to do work. But it does require people to make the effort to program and prioritize the space and time to get their work done. Um, remote work was actually exploding to prominence before COVID. I think COVID has simply shown more companies that it will work for them. Um, and going back to office first, working after this, as I say, would be strategic suicide for companies. Office first companies just won't be competitive. They'll be replaced by remote first companies and that will happen relatively quickly. Um, and that should make developing a remote work strategy a huge priority item for companies right now. They've had the opportunity, they've seen the problems. How are they gonna make this transition in a way that makes sense and really benefits them if anything like this ever happens again. And the problem for companies is, as I say, there's no easy way to do this. The way we look at it is that there's two halves of remote work. Um, the first is the obvious one. It's the tools, all the software we're all using to work remotely right now, communication, collaboration, documentation, super fast internet. You probably use some version of G Suite, Notion, Zoom, Hangouts, um, whereby Slack, Slight, Discord to operate right now. And there are thousands or hundreds of other options out there. Um, and they're really the table stakes for enabling remote work. The missing half of remote work then is focused on 
experience, culture, and human connection. This is where there's a massive opportunity because nobody's really solved these issues. Um, are you sat over your kitchen table doing work? That's a bad situation. Are you struggling to be heard on Zoom because your laptop's microphone's terrible? These are the problems everyone only knows that they have once they start to operate remotely, which is what we're living through right now. We're experiencing the challenge, challenges and obstacles of being a remote team that wasn't really apparent um, until you start working that way. And much of it's about the physical setup at home. Workers shouldn't have to cover that cost of having a great setup at home. The right tools and equipment are really table stakes for doing the best work that you've ever done um, at home. The problem, as I say, is that there's no easy way to get a remote team set up at home. There's no easy way to create a culture remotely. There's no easy way to enable human connection virtually. Um, the physical stuff, it's expensive. It comes with three to $5,000 of upfront costs. It's time consuming. Someone inherits that responsibility to manage that, to make sure that things turn up, to make sure they get things back when someone leaves. And then the third part is that it's risky. Workers using the wrong tools at home can get injured and the company could be held liable. And that was really what we focused on building for ourselves in our last startup. And I think what we've learned since then that every other company going remote is struggling with. We just wanted to make it easy to set up a remote team globally. Um, we wanted our team to have a great experience and be safer, more comfortable and productive at home than they could possibly be in, a, an, in an office. Um, and that's really what we wanted to facilitate and, and enable for companies. How could we help them supply and manage all the physical equipment remote workers need to do great work at home? How could we provide a foundation on which great remote work could be done um, without any of the hassle to companies? So could we manage that? Could we manage it as a monthly subscription rather than companies paying for it all up front? Could we take care of delivery, maintenance, repairs while things were deployed? Could we collect something if um, a worker left? Could we upgrade things at the end of a three-year cycle? And that was really what we wanted to create. And I think what we were relatively successful in doing so and learning that many companies had the same problem. And I think that's probably the conclusion that the office should be dead. Remote first companies will be far less talented. They'll lose their best people to their fiercest remote competitors. They'll be less diverse. Um, they'll find it harder to attract the most talented people. They'll be far less cost efficient. They'll be less productive. But we all know companies will go back to the office, which is bizarre. Um, and people should organize work around their life rather than the other way around. I think that's our key thing that we want to take away from remote work. How can we help people cut the commute from their lives entirely? How can we give them the freedom to live wherever they want rather than in an, ex in an expensive city? All while doing the best work that they've ever done in their lives. That's, that's really what remote work should be about delivering, um, but will it? I think that's what we're about to live through. So that's that's what we see the future coming out as. We've we've added an offer for any companies attending remote aid to our homepage. Um, you can check that out at firstbasehq.com forward slash remote aid. And yeah, we're, we're gonna take a couple of minutes before we jump into questions. So thanks, thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Chris. All right, it's time Sweet. for the thought exchange portion of our session where we can ask Chris some, some questions and share our thoughts live. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, I'm gonna close the exchange up. And Chris, I will hand it back over to you to address the top thoughts there, and I will scroll as you speak. So go ahead. Cool. So am I just reading from the top? Exactly. Yeah, cool. So on your screen there. Okay. So how do remote workers value their output and put a price on it for compensation versus the old time-based model of compensation? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think I typically think of it from the opposite perspective, which is how do companies get comfortable with the fact their teams are, or workers are going to work less hours to produce the same volume of work? And I think that's just generally what happens in an office, but we just 
<laughs> we just became very good at being able to pad out an eight hour day to make it look like we're busy all day. So yeah, I, I think there's there's probably two parts to that. It, it's, it's great if we could get to a better position around paying people for output. Um, but I think the other side to that is companies are just gonna have to get more comfortable with paying people the same as what they're paying them for less hours of actual work, hours of work worked because they're getting the same productivity as if they were in the office for 40 hours a week. How can employees, prospective employees, help support this shift to the non-office? I, I think it's it's probably a lot of its expectation. Um, I think a lot of companies right now see remote work as a perk. Um, COVID aside, I think prior to this, they still seen it as you're lucky for getting to work remotely. So perhaps we shoot it. We're not going to give you everything that you should have to do that. So, yeah, I think workers having higher expectations is going to drive this. I think um, great people moving from great offices to work remotely are going to demand this. Um, and I suspect as we progress further down the line, there's going to be regulation that ensures that um, remote workers are looked at after as well as people operating from offices are. Companies selling services online may be limited to hiring remote employees from states where they currently have physical offices due to taxes issues. How do you anticipate this may draw obstacles will be solved after COVID? Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. I think there's obviously a lot of awesome people trying to solve for this um, for contracted employees. So if what, what Alex and the team are doing at Deal, what Job and the team are doing at Remote um, is incredible. And I think as we progress, I think there's going to be a preference that shifts towards wanting to hire full-time remote workers rather than contractors potentially. So yeah, I think there's there's definitely something to be solved for here. Um, but I think there's a lot of great people working on this to solve this because clearly many people want to hire great talent out with the current state that they're working within. Um, many conversational jobs are still hiring in office only. Should we ask for, for remote flexibility before interviewing or wait until an interview or offer? Um, so this this probably goes back to what my assumption was, how remote work would, would rise in the first place. I, I always thought that it would be great people changing jobs that were stipulating their need or preference for remote work at the time of, of application. And that would just be um, basically a stipulation as to how they would come and work for them. So I think, yeah, being as upfront as possible, stipulating that you wouldn't work for someone under these scenarios, um, I think that's the way to do it. I think what's also interesting is to consider what's going to happen as we progress through coronavirus, where um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of companies that decide they're going to offer far more remote working opportunities. Some companies are going to decide they don't want to do that. So there's going to be a lot of overturn um, between those two types of companies where people are working for a company that isn't suited to their new preferences. So, yeah, I think there's this This is going to be good for a number of people. The big challenge with remote has always been that there has never been enough jobs to go around. I think Amir recently shared figures on Twitter about 9,000 applications or 900 applications for one job. Um, and I think that's going to be less of a challenge after this because I think there's going to be a lot more remote jobs. So, yeah, be up front. Tell them that you're looking for remote. And I think if you're you're the right candidate for that, they're going to give you that because they want to hire you. A recent buffer study found low uptake of co-work spaces due to cost and because they are generally in city centres so involved um, commute. Um, yeah, I, I've i never been a particularly big fan of co-working spaces. Anecdotally, I think the figures that most of them report in terms of occupancy are inflated. And I think it's just more of, of a replication of the existing model rather than trying to deal with the issues that people are trying to escape from. So I think the... I think the thing is that companies t think that their workers want co-working spaces, they pay for it, and then eventually the workers just stop turning up. So I think this is, 
it's it's really shone a light on what is possible for working remotely, working from home. Um, and I think actually there's probably room for a better third space than a co-working space. Um, I'm not too sure what that looks like. I think it could be a coffee shop that's in more within a geographic location. I spend a lot of time thinking about why Walmart beat Kmart in the US. So rather than being in these large geographic areas or larger city areas, they basically put them between cities. So I think there's probably a model like that that does that in a more suburban area where whether it's coffee shops, whether it's one home every 30 homes, um, not sure, but I think that's how we're, we're beginning to conceptualize what that might look like. Most companies don't know how to manage remote staff. The shift is more of a generation change than a fast reorganization. Um, 100%. I, I think a lot of this and the reason it hasn't proliferated as quickly as many have expected is because um, people just haven't felt comfortable. Higher managers just haven't felt comfortable in trusting their workers. Um, and I think this takes a while to get through to actual workers. So as millennials, I think, start to become uh, managers in these positions, I think that increases the frequency. I think COVID increases the frequency. And I think it's a it's a great point. It's, it's a generational change that's going to take time to come through. Um, I think what could change that is if boards start stipulating a need to attack a remote working strategy after this, because A, they've seen that it works. B, they know that people are more productive. C, they know companies are for, far more cost efficient. And there's going to be a large element of fear here where if people don't make this transition, if companies don't make this transition, other companies will who will take their most talented people who want to work remotely. So I think that fear is going to be an important driver for companies to really lean into this more heavily, potentially more quickly than they would have otherwise. You mentioned the risk of remote workers getting injured at home. How do you think companies deal with this risk and get comfortable with it? Um, I think for us, and clearly the perspective that we're building our business from is that remote workers deserve the same tools that office workers would get. Um, and I think that's a really easy lens to look at it from. How can we mitigate against the risk? Give people the right tools and equipment, give them regulatory compliant stuff, ergonomically correct furniture, um, and then give them the means to actually have someone come out and make sure that that's set up or let them report that in a way that's super easily. So I, th I think that's a tool thing. I think it's making sure that people understand that they need to come out and speak to people if something's wrong. But yeah, that's definitely the way that we see this going and the trends that we see from the companies that we're talking to. What do you think the future is for pro working spaces? as part of remote work toolkit um yeah so I'll, i i think that question is coming from the perspective of physical offices or, or more bespoke offices and how does that play a part um from what we're hearing and this is from clients that are fortune 500 companies through to commercial real estate brokers um large companies largely want to slash real estate um pretty quickly um they want to downsize, they want to move to a more remote worker. And what they'll expect is that people will come into that working office two or three times a week. And they'll do certain types of work there, they'll do certain types of work at home. Obviously the more deep focused stuff will happen while working remotely. Um, but I think the reality is that people are gonna move and want more remote as they start to get it. Um, and for me, that means that the remote, the, the, the pro working space, is going to change um, and it's going to evolve and it has to evolve to remain re relevant. So my thoughts on this are that it becomes more of a destination where very specific types of things happen. So I think everyone's opinion is that collaboration is always higher in person. I think that's largely true. I don't think it's as, as, as good as most people think it is. I think maybe it's 5% better or 10% better. It's not 100% better. So I think, yeah, it's, it's almost like these pro working spaces have to become um, they, they need to develop a new way to engage with workers and actually to help improve the quality of work that gets done, which everyone knows gets done while people are working remotely.
How long have you worked remotely? What made you do it in the first place? Um, I wanted to work remotely because I never wanted to commute anymore. I wanted to spend more time with my kids. And I was basically finding my first business, which was a fintech business. My CTO was about to have his first child and he wanted to see him laugh for the first time, see him walk for the first time. And we just knew that we would be more cost efficient and we'd be able to hire better people. So it made all the sense in the world for us to be remote. And yeah, we've done that two years ago and we've we've never looked back. In a decade, all the best companies are remote first. How do we go from there? Um, I, I think that's 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 largely the challenge is how do we get to a position where people have the flexibility to choose where they do their best work? And how can we get from a position which focuses on the working environment that we live in today, which is that instantaneous gratification, distraction factory, adult kids club where people come and tap you on the shoulder, disrupt you from doing your work. And for me, the first transition is how can we get to remote first first? Um, and then the next transition comes, okay, well now we're comfortable with this. How can we get to asynchronous first? And I think that's actually the longer burn. I think companies are really going to struggle with that. So I, I'm not sure, maybe companies go remote first and then they just decide to remain synchronous first. I think if that happens, there'll probably be a movement that says, okay, we're remote first and async first. And I think ultimately 10 years from now, they're the companies that, that end up dominating. We still struggle to make people work undistributed, e.g. undisturbed, e.g. with slack off for our daily dark time. Any tips to help? Um, for us personally, we just, turn it off. Um, and I, I realize that's not the best response when some people are still going to go on it. But yeah, I think short of closing things for the period in which you do it, which would be awesome. Um, we've we've struggled with this as well. I think it's there's there's no real good answers for this. I think if you could go into Slack and pause it for a four hour period each day, that would be incredible. Um, but ultimately, people are still going to find ways around that to communicate. So yeah, I think this is something we struggle with a lot. How do you ensure that people's undisturbed time is undisturbed? Um, but yeah, any any recommendations for this? I'd, I'd love them as well, because I think that's a great product. Chris seems to have debunked all of the excuses I heard for people not working remote not working remotely. I have worked worked from home many times and did find I was much less efficient due to distractions and inadequate equipment set up at home. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's no secret sauce here. I think re working remotely from home can be distracting. Um, but I think to your point, the right, the, the, the best way to start is with the right foundation. How can we give remote workers the right tools so that they've got a specific space that they go to to do their work in? And I think for us, that's that's clearly the focus that we take. That's clearly the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and I think part of having that is that it limits your distractions because you've got this psychological space that you go to um, when you're doing that remote work. Oh, I think you're potentially muted. I'm muted. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> so that was all the questions that we had, and we're right at 2 p.m. Great timing. Awesome presentation. Thanks so much. Awesome. Cheers, guys.